All right, so I'm going to talk about a uh, problem that he touched on in one of his slides. Uh, again, we're looking for opportunities. We're looking for synergistic uh, opportunities where we can turn problems into solutions. And uh, I have the privilege of talking today about the Sargassum problem in the Caribbean, our thinking on it, and how we, um, our ideas, and, and how it relates to perhaps carbon mitigation as well. So uh, this is Sargassum seaweed. This is a private lagoon somewhere in the Caribbean. And in the background is a $25 million villa. Uh, if you don't know, Sargassum is one of the most common macroalgaes in the world. It's a brown algae. It's the only homopelagic uh, algae in the world, which means that it, it floats for the entirety of its life cycle. Uh, it, it's spawned in the open ocean, and, uh, and, and it, it, it grows, and it floats, and it eventually dies and sinks. Um, it was named Sargassum by uh, Christopher Columbus because the bubbles reminded him of grapes, and it's the Portuguese word for grapes. Um, in the last seven years, this has been inundating Caribbean beaches. It's been blooming in uh, unprecedented and increasing quantities, and it's causing a lot of problems for them. So to summarize those, uh, this sargassum is, is highly seasonal. It will arrive on beaches. It will die. It will rot. It will dye waters brown. It will create offensive smells. It will create an eyesore. Uh, it affects coastal villages. The dust, uh, particulate matter, as well as the evolved gases from the putrefaction will uh, erode appliances, will destroy machinery, and it will cause respiratory issues. This stuff is also, it will accumulate in amounts where it can stop you know, 300 horsepower outboard motors, and it can really disrupt fishing villages, um, f fishing activities, and really disrupt coastal villages. Um, the vice president of the University of West Indies recently said that this is the single biggest threat to the Caribbean. Uh, the World Tourist and Travel Commission uh, has reported that uh, tourism accounts for over 4% of the combined, combined GDP of the Caribbean. And the recent mayor-elect of Quintana Roo has stated that just from Sargassum alone, uh, they have uh, suffered a 35% decrease in tourism this year. So with our friends in the Dominican Republic, and we have Andres Bessono with us here, who's been a great help, with our friends and partners, uh, we conducted our own investigation into the problem. And certainly, a lot has been done. There's a lot of great engineers and minds in the Caribbean who have come up with solutions. Um, most of them are focused near the coast. So I'll take you through these quickly. A lot of places still focus on hand collection. They'll wait for the sargassum to make landfall, and they'll get out as fast as possible, start cleaning it. They'll bury it. They'll use it to make volleyball courts and try to make it look nice. Um, there's also machinery that's been developed to rake the stuff off of the, off of the sand. This leads to a lot of uh, beach erosion. And these things are very expensive as well. There's also barriers. A lot of people have made barriers to stop the sargassum or at least slow it down. Um, and then harvesting boats as well to maintain the sargassum outside of the barrier so that it doesn't pile up and slip underneath. There's also been a lot of work um, by oceanographers to develop early warning systems. Uh, you can use uh, spectroscopy and hyperspectral imaging to identify sargassum patches and, and track them over time and, and even separate them from other ocean debris. And there's been a lot of hype around valorization of the sargassum, of turning it into, in, into product. Um, here's, uh, in the top right, someone who built a, a house out of sargassum bricks. Um, and there's been a lot of study over the last 100 years, actually, into biochemicals, pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, biomass feedstock. Uh, one of the most promising options would be biofuel. But there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. And this is really an urgent and, and, and pressing issue that needs to be addressed. So what do we see as the limitations of current strategies? Um, all the strategies I went over that are currently being implemented in the Caribbean wait until the sargassum is at the shore. Um, it will, whether you stop it on the shore or you stop it just meters off the shore, it will still uh, accumulate. It will still die. It will still rot. It will still look bad. It will still smell bad. It will cause all the same problems. Um, these solutions make a lot of sense as first measures, but this distributed strategy can't possibly grow fast enough um, to, to have a big difference anytime soon. So where do we come in? What, what, what do we think a solution should be? Well, we do not think it should be a biological solution. We do not think, we do not understand, we're machine designers, we don't understand enough about the reproductive biology of the sargassum. 
um, and certainly aren't up to pursuing large environmental engineering uh, approaches to tackle this problem. This is how we comprehend the problem. Well, you can attack sargassum in, in basically three locations, on land, offshore, or in the open ocean. When you find sargassum, you can either redirect it somewhere where it's not a problem, you can redirect it and then collect it where it would be more desirable to do so. You can collect it only, or you can search it out, and you can deal with it wherever you find it, wherever you're seeing it on satellite images. When you do find it, you can put it in a landfill, you can harvest it, or you can just simply eliminate it, which we take to mean sinking. And again, it would be simple to do so if you could just pop the pneumaticists, the bladders that help it maintain its buoyancy. And this is where you guys come in. This is why we're here. Um, so we see an opportunity to also gain some carbon mit mitigation out of this. So sargassum it plays a natural role in the biological pump of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it will incorporate CO2 into its biomass. It will sink naturally. Fish will eat it, and fecal pellets will sink to the bottom of the ocean. And it will also emit recalcitrant dissolved uh, organic carbons, which will also sink to the bottom of the ocean and be effectively sequestered forever. <laughs> okay. um, and so, our, again, our solution is open ocean elimination, sinking the stuff. Um, and we believe that both from avoiding putting the stuff in landfills, um, avoiding putting the stuff in landfills, um, eliminating it from the Caribbean Ocean and letting more phytoplankton grow, having a net increase in the biological efficiency of the carbon pump in the Caribbean uh, will lead to a large uh, carbon se sequestration and possibly a large amount of private interest in this venture. And the key value proposition behind our strategy is that there's a lot less of this stuff in the open ocean. If you let it get to the coast, not only do you, do you not have a lot of buffer to deal with it when it arrives suddenly, um, but it grows. It, this stuff is known to double in 30 days in the open ocean, and when it gets into nitrogen and phosphorus rich waters, uh, near the Caribbean, it will double every 10 days. And so this stuff can double four to five times over as it travels in. So dealing with it at the end of its life cycle, um, we, we, we don't think it's such a great approach. Um, and so again, we're in a heavy uh, developmental and exploratory phase right now. There's a lot we don't understand about the ecology and biology of the sargassum. And so I would invite any of you to come up to my, my poster. We'll be at the expo. And perhaps tell us the questions that we surely haven't thought of yet. Thank you. So I'm talking about applications for high contaminant recycled HDPE. And the US generates 254 million tons of waste per year and 3.1 million tons of plastics recycling, but we're still sending 23% of our recyclables to our landfills. Um, the goal of this project that I'm working on is to develop methodologies and applications for recycled HGPE with higher percentage of contaminants um, with the goal of reducing CO2 emissions. Why are we looking at HDPE? Well, HDPE accounts for 29.5% of all plastic recyclings, and it's used in many common products. But for each one kilogram of virgin HDPE we make, it takes 1.75 kilograms of oil to make that, which leads to 11.8 billion metric tons of CO2 emissions annually just from manufacturing of new virgin HDPE per year. But when you go to recycle HDPE, it's non-biodegradable. And only 30% of the HDP made is going to be recycled at the end of its life cycle. Currently, limitations to the HDP recycling process. There's difficulty sorting with polypropylene, which is extremely common as well, because they're both similar densities and you can't separate during the normal float sink method. And you end up with material properties issues when trying to replicate the exact uh, material that you started out with, with the reheating process and also from the contaminants. And also many customers, again, when they're looking for the exact same material out from the beginning, they're not gonna wanna accept the color differences because um, many manufacturers have to dye everything black um, so you don't get nice color variation like that. And then lastly, due to the low cost of crude oil in the last couple of years is de-incentivize people from picking HD, recycled HDP as the material. So what we're really looking at in this whole manufacturing process is we're focusing in on the local recycling facility and the bales they're making before they sell it to a reclaimer for reprocessing. 
U.S. reclaimers are aiming to replicate uh, perfect virgin material, so therefore they're only looking to accept concentrations of sub 1%, and then from there they're even sorting out even more to try to make it as perfect a material as possible. Previously, lots of our local recycling facilities, um, which are outputting about 2 to 3%, were sending those uh, bales internationally to be additionally manually sorted and reclaimed. But with changes in China's policies, they're now looking for 0.5%. So this really leaves a gap between the 1% and the 2 to 3%, and that's where we're looking coming to come in, and that's our market opportunity for high contaminant recycled HDPE. So the China issue is that they've been the dominant worldwide leader of um, recycling for the last 20 years, mainly because of their um, cheap labor and proximity to final manufacturing. We ship 60 tons of HDPE alone to China every single day. But as of January 1st of this year, China made a ban, and they now are um, banning 24 types of recycling imports, and any imports that do come in have to be a sub 0.5% contamination. And this has really been hard hitting to the US recycling recyclers because that's not what they're outputting and they don't really know what to do. And 15% of all curbside recycling is mixed in trash. So our approach is to take advantage of that gap. And we aim to explore the use of high contaminant recycled HDPE with the goal of creating a new dirty feedstock that can be used for applications that don't necessarily need perfect materials um, or have a long lifespan. This is a potential to save up to 934,000 um, metric tons of CO2 emissions uh, for all the applications that we're currently under investigation. And we really want to take advantage of this market opportunity that we see. And we're looking at a whole bunch of different applications, um, everything from Home Depot five-gallon buckets to irrigation pipes and things like that that might need already be able to take advantage um, of some of the impurities that might come from a high contaminant material. And then we're also looking to combine into things that were already mentioned from Alex Slocum's talk, like the uranium shells, and then Luke's Sargasms project. Thanks. Hello, my name is Roger Allen. I'm going to be talking about ultra inexpensive ground mounted photovoltaics or PV. This device? It's a complicated device. Yeah, no kidding. Which one is it? Gotcha. It doesn't look like a button. <laughs> All right. So let's start with a brief intro to photovoltaics. Uh, more energy comes from the sun uh, to the earth in one hour than all energy used by the global economy in a full year. Uh, while our coal, oil, and gas reserves are finite, the sun will continue to shine for at least 5 billion years. So there's been a dramatic reduction in the cost of silicon voltaics. And the cost continues to fall between 2009 and 2015. The cost fell about 75%. Um, so the photovoltaics are pretty inexpensive at this point. So what about the balance of systems? They've largely remained unchanged and in some cases actually increased in cost. So this is a typical photo photovoltaic system. Um, the question is, does it need to be this complicated? Do we need this many parts? Each part in this system is a single point of failure. So if anything fails, the entire system stops working. In engineering, it's, question, or it's important to question every single component of a system and how vital it is. So what adds to the cost of PV? With a typical PV system, the cost of the panels makes up only about a third of the total system cost. The other two thirds comes from other materials, engineering, and labor. Um, in this graph, though, the uh, 68 cents for PV, this is from 2015. The cost of that has gone dramatically down since this, uh, this data was taken. So this is a, an example of a simplified photovoltaic system consisting of just the photovoltaics, the battery, charge controller, and the load. The battery stores energy because you don't usually need solar in the middle of the day because you're, you, usually if you're in a developing area, you're going to be using it for light. The sun's out, don't need it. So you definitely need storage. So we have a battery. We've got a charge controller so that the photovoltaics don't overcharge the battery and damage it. Um, this is the simplest form of a practical PV system. So typical ground mounting and why? The biggest thing with ground mounting is you typically have large amounts of aluminum framing into concrete, um, concrete structures, and they're always tilted. 
The question here is, why is PV tilted? The point is, if you point your PV directly at the sun, you optimize its output. So the question is, how necessary is that angling? So on this slide, this is uh, data for a 30 degree north latitude, which is approximately where we are here. You can notice if you lay your panels flat at zero degrees, you only lose 7% of output. You, get, you have 93% of your total output. So what do you really need for racking? Essentially, you just need to hold the weight, and here in Florida, wind conditions get very high, especially with category five, so that's what we're designing for. So we started simple, please don't laugh. So it's just sandbags with a slight tilt. We just wanted to see how, they would, how it would go, what would happen if the rain and uh, dust accumulation from wind would affect it too much. But four weeks later, it turns out sandbags aren't good in the sun. So they deteriorated after only four weeks, so we quickly switched from that to cinder blocks with steel, uh, steel strapping to uh, keep the panels stationary during high winds. Uh, we did have some problems with des this design. It was pretty easy to pull the panels off. The, stain the, the banding could be moved pretty easily, and it started to rust pretty quickly. So our final solution, we banked up the solar panels to use uh, fewer materials. We switched to stainless steel banding so that it wouldn't deteriorate. And we also designed a custom aluminum bracket, which made installation very easy. You can actually install this system with only hand tools. And if the, um, if the ground permits, you don't actually have to do much um, development of the land. You can just show up, put this down. It's very easy. The drawbacks to the system is the panels only sit about 10 inches off the ground, which means you have to control vegetation. If you don't have proper drainage, you could easily flood the system. So with addressing the storms, that's where the custom brackets came in. They're pretty easy to manufacture. Um, and you can see the stainless steel banding on the left there goes down between the webbing of the cinder block to keep it held down in place. And that was how we made sure that they didn't go anywhere. So the cost savings on these, the system cost for this has been reduced by 87%, making installation, cost of insulation a lot easier. Additionally, with how you can um, arrange these, you can, um, it takes half the amount of land to produce the same amount as a typical angled solar panel. Now this only applies in about 30 degrees uh, north and south latitude and closer to the equator. This is the only areas where this system really has um, advantages. So performance and scale, as I said, 80% um, less cost, 50% the area. It's easy to install. This can be installed pretty much anywhere as long as you have flat ground. Um, and the scale, you can just keep adding solar panels to your heart's content, whatever you need. Hello, everyone. I'm Valerie. I'm also part of Professor Slocum's group. I'll be talking about the water hyacinth problem and why 1 over sad equals happy. It can potentially be an opportunity. So water hyacinth, it was a big problem here in Florida as of a few decades ago. Recently, it's been relatively well controlled. Globally, we estimate about 1 to 3 million hectares of coverage just of water hyacinth. That's about 2 to 6 million acres. Um, and the reason it's taken over waterways is because it doubles so quickly, much like potentially sargassum in the Caribbean. Um, it takes over lakes, it chokes ecosystems, it prevents fisher boats from going through. Here in Florida, about 40,000 acres are actively treated for water hyacinth, um, and treated generally means spraying herbicides to prevent it from growing. And in China, India, it's a big problem as well. So. If we pretended for a second that these invasive biomass crops had been purposefully planted, which in a sense they were because they thrive off of polluted waters, fertilizer runoff, and the like, um, we estimate that just based, based off of a sustainable growth rate, uh, we could offset 27 million tons of carbon dioxide per year, and potentially even more if you include in developing worlds, you would be offsetting energy resources like wood and charcoal. Um, and this is, all our analysis is based off of anaerobic digestion, which is a relatively mature technology. So maybe to highlight the point that water hyacinth is potentially useful, in China in 2011, they had one of the largest projects I've seen in literature where they were actually actively planting water hyacinth. Like I said, it's very good in polluted water, so they were actually using it for water management. Um, but even then, they were using it for anaerobic digestion. They were feeding it to cows and goats. They were trying out all sorts of things. Um, but the big thing was that 
the cost to plant it uh, was still pretty expensive and the risks that the study mentioned were primarily transporting and storing a plant that is 90% water, um, transport distances of up to five kilometers. And of course in, you know, 80% of the world, they're trying to get rid of this stuff by driving large, effectively lawn mowers through the water. And here in China, they're trying to plant it. Um, so there's an ecological safety risk involved in that. So to address some of these main risks are the project we have, which we're partnering with a group in India to do, um, is to look at mobile harvesting, pre-processing, and conversion of water hyacinth. Um, first of all, treat the invasive species. It is a pest, but it's also a natural biomass crop that is extremely good at growing. Um, and by doing things where this low density crop is, we can potentially save a lot on transport. Um, and just a few strategies uh, that we've been coming up with, uh, which are not mutually exclusive, um, potentially just going along the water, filling and packing anaerobic digesters as you go. Uh, we also, the partner we're working with uh, has a partnership with an anaerobic digester company which has succeeded in developing world scenarios. And also in terms of self-sustainability, the transport, pre-processing, and the whole system we have calculated to only need about 10 to 15 percent of the gas coming out the other side. So that means that the fertilizer and the other 80 percent of the biogas could be used for the market and for a lot of areas like Lake Tana in Africa, which are, they don't have very good energy access. And because water hyacinth thrives in fertilizer runoff, um, it's generally co-located with farms. Um, so that's the idea and definitely check us out at the expo and give us any feedback or questions that you have. Thank you. My name is Logan Armagost. I'll be presenting on the SLB50, which is a solar lithium ion battery bank. So currently there are 1.4 billion people living without access to electricity. Uh, so this not only has negative impacts on their health and safety, but also hinders the potential education and communication in uh, these communities. So traditionally, electrical utility is based on centralized power plants uh, with distribution networks to get the power from the source many miles away to where it's needed. Um, so in these developing nations, this infrastructure doesn't exist. Uh, not only that, but they don't have the natural resources to power said power plants. So um, there's a trend away from centralized power to distributed power, where the power is made, the energy is made next to where it is going to be used, very close. Uh, so this increases reliability and decreases the cost of infrastructure. So nobody can argue that tech changes at a very rapid pace, uh, quickly becoming old or uh, several generations old very quickly. Um, so this, this causes massive cost reduction in just a few years. So how, how can this be applied? Uh, there are countless examples of this in consumer electronics we use every day. So tech that has been well exploited or can be considered obsolete right now can be used in developing countries to possibly solve problems of global challenges through economic development. So combining scalar, uh, not scalar, solar voltaic cells, digital control circuitry, lithium ion battery storage, we've developed a safe, reliable, and affordable way to provide clean energy for single family units. So this is our, this is our first prototype, not the most attractive device. Uh, a 16 lithium ion battery device with a one single USB output. Uh, we've come quite a long way though. Now where we are here, you wanna, you wanna show this off? Uh, we have a custom printed circuit board uh, with just four lithium ion batteries instead of 16 and uh, in a plastic injection molded housing. So the energy bank is sized to meet the needs of a single family unit. It'll charge two smartphones and provide five hours of continuous lighting to a 100 square foot space. It requires no training to operate, and a single person can assemble 18 of these units in uh, one day. So as far as powering the SLB50, our first attempt at making a solar panel is this right here. Uh, it consists of 10 polycrystallite PV cells on a 18 inch by 14 inch wooden frame with a whopping output of 13.4 watts. These cells are layered in thermoplastics and heated with a heat gun, turning them transparent, allowing a the solar energy to be perform, uh, absorbed by these cells. So where we are today, 
solar panel right here. Uh, half the size, producing only 25% less energy, just sufficient enough for the SLB50. The manufacturing is similar, but we're now using a vacuum forming uh, technique where the plastics are pulled more tightly over the cells, allowing them to become more transparent and making the cells more efficient as a result. So bringing it all together, the manufacturing goal um, cost is $20 for one solar energy cell and um, solar cell. The goal is to identify entrepreneurs in developing countries, train them to produce the energy bank and the solar panels uh, in their facilities with their in-country labor, and then the entrepreneurs would then be responsible for distributing and servicing the products. So the design is complete, the prototypes have been built, and test sites in Haiti are being chosen right now. And discussion is underway with potential Haitian manufacturers to assemble the product. So the United, United Nations has established 17 sustainable development goals, of which four are directly impacted by this project. Uh, most closely supported is probably goal seven, affordable and clean energy. Uh, due to the low cost, the SLB 50 has potential for widespread adoption of the populace of a developing nation. It provides clean energy throughout its life by harnessing the power of the sun without the use of fossil fuels. Moving on to goal eight and nine, uh, decent work and economic growth and industry innovation and infrastructure. Uh, this is accomplished through a major goal of the project, which is the local in-country manufacturing, distribution and services. And then finally, goal four, a quality education. This is impacted by creating an enhanced learning environment within a single family home. So the 1.4 billion people uh, have two choices when the sun goes down, they can either go to bed or they can purchase small amounts of kerosene with meager funds to produce uh, minimal temporary low quality lighting. Uh, not only this, but the kerosene lamps are safety hazards obviously and create um, detriments to health to the people using them. So on the contrary, the SLB50 can provide a clean white LED light that will offer new opportunities for extended learning and productivity through the night. Thank you.